so today's uh, subject is the spiritual discipline of fasting and prayer. I have titled it as the spiritual discipline of fasting and prayer. So um, there is a story of two woodcutters. You know, they were one was a senior uh, woodcutter, and he was uh, cutting timber for so many years. And there was another young man also, and he saw that this uh, older person. You know, in America we call them the lumberjacks. You know, he was very. Uh, he was very diligent and he was able to do a good job and also one day this young man asked him that uh, what is the secret how do you work like this uh, I think one day we will set up where we will compete and see that who cuts the maximum logs so they fixed a date and this both of them started cutting logs and uh, at the end of the day uh, this young man could not cut that much as the older person did. And the young man asked this older person that what happened? How did you do a better job even though you were resting? I saw you taking periods of rest but even then you did a greater job than what I could do. So this older person said to the young person, the times you thought I was resting, I was actually sharpening my axe. And that made the difference. When I sharpened my axe, I could do the job in a better way. And praise God for the wonderful joy of salvation, the glorious experience that God has given us. But this is a spiritual discipline, the discipline of fasting and prayer, which is often neglected and the price we need to pay is enormous. And before we go into the discipline of fasting and prayer, I'd like to give you a little bit background on how we need to see this discipline, how we need to see this discipline and what we need to understand about this discipline. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we as a church, we want to please you and we want to honor you. Our passion is to know you and also to make you known. And uh, especially Lord ADF's uh, mission to disciple people of all nations. Our desire is that we will be on the cutting edge for you, Lord. We will not be mediocre, but we will be the best for you. And Lord, your word talks about certain spiritual disciplines that we need to embrace. And help us, Lord, together as we look at this discipline that we will understand your heart and this is something that we will embrace to please you to move into your ways to bring honor to you Lord and I thank you for each one of your children who have taken their precious time to come and be in your presence I do not know where they are in their spiritual journey but I pray that Lord you will speak to each one of them and that you will increase them that you will help them Lord to move into all your plans for their lives thank you in Jesus name Amen God's word places all people into three categories if you look at God's word we see three categories one is the natural natural person natural man or woman in 1 Corinthians 15, 44, Paul is talking about this natural man. Natural man is uh, somebody who cannot understand the things of God. And because of sin, Romans talks about Adam's sin which has corrupted mankind and he is not able to see what God godly things he's not able to understand godly things and uh, beautiful description we find in uh, Matthew 6 where he's talking about uh, the natural man is only flesh oriented he's only thinking about his body he's only thinking about what to eat drink how to take care of his body because 
the god consciousness is not there sin uh, has separated this person from god and the things of god and he cannot understand the things of god but the moment this person hears the message of the cross and places his trust on the finished work of the cross uh, there is a total change and uh, he becomes a spiritual person uh, like romans 6:23 any man is in christ he is a new creation uh, it's a new creation a new position is given and now uh, instead of instead of the body soul and spirit he is spirit soul and body and there is a god consciousness in him which he needs to move into that and he needs to progress towards maturity but if this spiritual position which god has given him is not following the spiritual disciplines uh, he is going to end up as a carnal man or a worldly person he has experienced the work of the cross but in his life there is still carnality is walking according to the flesh i wish i had a board to uh, explain that uh, that the how the bible looks at people as a natural man a spiritual man and a carnal person this is basically when we look at the whole mankind we can see them as the human kind can be divided into the saved and the unsaved person and the saved can be categorized into spiritual and carnal spiritual and carnal so spiritual and carnal we are seeing that the the natural man is body soul and spirit but the cross changes this position into spirit soul and body but who is the carnal man the carnal man is having the same spirit soul and body but he chooses to walk according to the flesh romans 8 13 14 as many as are led by the spirit they are the sons and daughters of god and being led by the spirit means through the spirit putting to death the works of the flesh romans 8 13 it talks so how does the spirit or spiritual man grow or how do we grow that's very important so how do we grow and that's where we see uh, the spiritual disciplines of prayer meditating the word and fellowshipping with the saints the three this spiritual disciplines is very important because what god has done for us he has done through jesus christ and there is nothing we can add to that but there are certain things that god wants us to do which we need to do which god is not going to do for us and those are spiritual disciplines of prayer meditating god's word and fellowshipping with the saints the very important disciplines and the more you are going to embrace these disciplines that's when we are going to do grow in, into the ways of god but uh, i want to ask you uh, brothers and sisters that these three disciplines uh, god has called us to embrace but uh, can we do it with our strength so how do how do we go about it how do we go about it praise god for the blessed holy spirit hallelujah that's where god has given us the holy spirit the spirit of truth the spirit that convicts us about sin righteousness and judgment and the spirit of god that leads us the holy spirit helps us to pray the holy spirit brings it to us an awareness that we are the children of the most high god the holy spirit helps the logos word the written word to become a rhema word for our need the holy spirit opens our understanding to god's word and the holy spirit puts love god's love into our heart so that we can fellowship with the saints and we are willing to love each other with the god kind of love and we are able to serve each other in humility and manifest god's love to the world outside so the disciplines 
of prayer, meditating God's word and fellowship with the saints is done with the help of the blessed Holy Spirit. And this will help us to move from the positional truth that Christ has saved us and imputed his righteousness to us to the practical truth of being witnesses of the kingdom through our life and deed. Now two words I use. Positional truth. Positional truth is the truth that through the cross we are saved. We are a new creation. And how do we know? Move into the practical truth that we are the salt and the light in this world and we are people who reflect the kingdom values. This is very important. And for this process there are certain elements that are very very important. First is God's word. God's word is crucial. We need to understand what is God telling to us about everything in our life. Everything. What does God's word say and what does God's word want us to do about it? Everything. About our thought life. About, about every aspect of our life. The principles that we follow and uh, the truths that we take into account is from God's word. So God's word is important. Psalm, uh, the Psalm 119, where, which is a beautiful Psalm on the importance of God's word. The psalmist says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Great peace have they that love their law and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. So many such words. The word of God is very important to move from the positional truth, truth to the practical truth. Second is not only knowing the word of God, but obedience to God's word. Obedience. Regular practice of biblical principles. It's very important. I want to some of the verses we will look uh, and uh, we will uh, reflect on some truths. And when we come to Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 19 verse 5, it says, Now if you obey me fully, I am reading Exodus chapter 19 verse 5. Here God is saying to the people, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, whom is God speaking here? Beg your pardon? Yeah, God is speaking to whom? To which people? To, yes. What happened? In chapter 19, we see that God delivered them from the bondage of Egypt. And we know that after three months journey they come to Mount Sinai when two things God does one is giving them the law okay giving them the law and uh, we all know that the law reflects the character of God so when you obey the law when you obey what God's word you're going to reflect the character of God and when you reflect the character of God you're going to bring glory to God you're fulfilling his purpose so God is telling to the people, I have delivered you from bondage to reflect my character and bring glory to my name. And if you do that, I am making a covenant, an agreement with you that I will be your God and you will be my people. Amazing. That has profound implications. The writer of Hebrews says the the covenant, the Old Testament covenant was made with blood of bulls and goats. But the New Testament covenant is made with the precious blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's a powerful thing. What is God saying to us that if you are committed for my glory, I am committed to you. And in that context, look at this verse. It says here that... If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Amazing. And again, God is saying to the people, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is amazing. 
like you said god said this through moses to the people what is god saying here god is saying here that the whole earth is mine but in the whole earth there are some special people for me and who are they they are ones who obey my word praise the lord they are the one who obey me fully and keep my covenant bring honor to me and that's when god is giving a a mandate to these people that these people who are my treasured possession i am giving them a responsibility of being a kingdom of priests that's what adds power to our prayer that god has given us the authority to intercede for nations based on the fact that we obey god's word and we are true to him now we are looking at this truth that to move from the positional truth to the practical truth firstly we need to know god's word secondly we need to obey god's word and regularly practice biblical principles that's what paul says uh, be renewed by the transforming of your mind now don't be conformed to to the world but be renewed be renewed let me tell you we all carry a lot of baggage we all carry a lot of baggage you know we say okay we have we are in christ everything but definitely you know at some point of time when there is some choice or decision to make there is some baggage coming up you know like and uh, we, we we miss out uh, doing god's will it's very interesting when we see uh, and this is irrespective of all the things in in kerala we have this uh, a very funny thing you know that during weddings uh the bride is all uh, the the groom is all decked up to go to the church and uh, you will see they are not moving they are they are not going so somebody will ask what's happening and suddenly somebody some elder will say that uh, one of our uncles have yet to come and uh, nobody has any clue uh, who is this uncle nobody has clue but later on when you find out it was nothing they were waiting for that auspicious time which they have checked from the astrologer is the best time to move out from the house to go to the church amazing so they believe that you know this family that is going to uh, be formed they should be have a very good future so we believe in the lord everything but then we also believe in little bit yeah some things yeah friends if we have uh this word this is enough for godliness and life this word is enough for godliness life and we need to regularly practice and another thing i've seen sometimes in north india you know believers are very devout they will pray oh lord we ask for favor protection and the blood of the lamb everything and when you go on the road you suddenly see a billi pass karta hai wapas mud jayenge jayenge nahi kyun ashub ho gaya just now to be and the worship team sang this beautiful song you know uh, the god of uh, angel army is by my side by my side and he is there but uh, i am afraid of a cat <laughs> what a beautiful confession we make but practically when it comes you know uh, we get we get we move out but see that's where we need to regularly practice biblical principles especially in the areas of our personal life obedience of god's word regular practice when we practice it that's when we are going to come out of the old patterns and we are going to embrace the biblical principles in john 14 23 also we see the same uh, truth repeated we are looking at some of the elements essential elements in the process of moving from the positional truth that christ has saved us and imputed his righteousness to us to the practical truth of becoming the salt and the light or witnesses of his kingdom through our life and deed so god's word and obedience of god's word regular practice of biblical principles and the third thing is time time is very important any time you uh, 
I'll, I'll encourage you to do this exercise once you go home. Now take a piece of paper and uh, based on Psalm 90, uh, the days of our life are how much? Psalm 90? Huh? Psalm, in the Psalm 90, yeah. Huh? 80, yeah, 80. Uh, no, 80 means uh, it is normally 70, but the psalmist says by strength 80, no? I think you're all looking at me whether I'm saying out of the scripture or... So it's good to... It is there? That scripture is there? Okay. Psalm 90, you know. It, it talks there about the transitory nature of man and the, and the eternity and the greatness of our God. So it says in verse 10, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Okay. And uh, recently the statistics in India. What is the statistics that came out in India? 65. 65, yes. So this is coming down because we are getting all adulterated food. Pollution all around. You, know? <laughs> you don't get good stuff to eat. But look at verse 12. It says, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And here, what we are seeing is that the exercise I was asking you to do is Keep 80 or might be add 10 more years because you're using all organic food. <laughs> Use 10 more years, 90 and then subtract the present age and see how much you have got left. 120, no has. You have to go back to the... Okay. Huh? That is Genesis age. Eh? Well, God bless you. Like, more than 120. Methuselah, 965. Methuselah, 965. <laughs> wow. Organic. Wow. God bless you with that. Yeah. But what... <laughs> but whatever it is, what I'm trying to say is our time is limited, friends. And God wants us to be disciplined in the use of our time. Ephesians 5.15 talks about redeeming the time. So these are elements that is very important. God's word, obedience and practice, time. And third is fellowship with other believers. Hebrews 10, 24 says, as the day is approaching, we need to fellowship. Why do we fellowship? Why do we fellowship? Very good. Yes, very good to strengthen ourselves. Yes, because God has not called us to be islands. God has called us as a community. Once you're baptized, you are coming into the community, community of the church. And uh, what else do you think? Why do we fellowship with believers? To encourage them. To encourage them. Yeah. To encourage. Okay. And also I believe that a very crucial thing is to build character. Build character. Because ultimately, the whole purpose of God bringing us into fellowship is to build character. The fruit of the spirit, love. And if there are no difficult people, how can we build character? <laughs> if there are no difficult people, how can character be a bit? So, if we are praying only for angels in our church, we better not pray. That God will not answer the prayer. There will be people with different temperaments, different, uh, different uh, manners and different habits. But when God brings us as a family... God's command for us is to love each other and clothe ourselves, you know, with humility and be prepared to serve others and to help them to move into what God is calling them to do. So, fellowship with the believers and the fifth element in helping us to move as witnesses of the kingdom, that is from the positional to the practical truth, is fasting and prayer. Is fasting and prayer. Now, this is a discipline, unfortunately, very much neglected in Christendom. Also in many churches, this is a totally uh, spiritual discipline and I'm glad that Pastor Neeraj is, uh, God put into his heart to look into this spiritual discipline. You look not only at God's word, but also throughout church history, if there has been any breakthrough 
any serious breakthrough and any way God's people have moved into God's plan, it has when God's people have humbled themselves, fasted and prayed. And it's very crucial for us that if we want to move from the positional truth of God saving us into the practical truth of being his witnesses through our life and through our deed, fasting and prayer is a very essential element in this process. And then we have praise and worship and absolute dependency on the Holy Spirit. So this is a position, this is a picture I wanted to give in the background that God when he saves us, we are spirit, soul and body and we, know, we no longer should be carnal walking according to the flesh but we need to be led by the spirit, Romans 8, 13, 14 means by the spirit put to death the deed of the flesh and be move from the positional truth into the practical truth and we saw certain elements that are important in that a crucial element is fasting and prayer and after that I just like to quickly go why we should fast and pray why we should fast and pray the scripture teaches us to fast and pray the scripture teaches us to fast and pray and we'll be looking at the some of the key verses in New Testament and Old Testament also and fasting and prayer is the key to breakthrough if there is any area that you are struggling with you're not getting a breakthrough I will encourage you to fast and pray you will see their breakthrough in that area fasting and praying now when I said that let me come to some important facts on fasting these are some important statements which I have noted which I'd like to deal with and then we go into the aspect of fasting in the Old Testament biblical fasting means going without food it's a voluntarily abstinence from food biblical fasting means going without food I had a friend and he told me I'm fasting and uh, I said, oh, total fast. No, no, no. I take a lot of fruits and I take uh, khichdi. I said, wow, that's a good fasting. And then he says, I take this, this, this also and, that's, and then I'm fasting. And I was wondering, that means on the regular days, what all he eats? <laughs> but let me tell you, that is a partial fast which we see in the case of Daniel chapter 10 we will see a partial fast where he abstained from choice foods okay some people go on that fast nothing wrong with that you can be led by that but biblical fasting very clearly means voluntarily abstaining, abstaining from food and fasting is linked to prayer fasting is linked to prayer if you're fasting you should spend your time in praying and meditating on God's word. You should not fast for losing weight. If you do that, it's a dieting. It's not fasting. So fasting and praying and waiting in God's presence is crucial. It is linked to prayer, meditating on God's word. And like Pastor Neeraj was mentioning, it's not arm um, twisting no, twisting the arm of God. But the purpose of fasting is not punishing the flesh, but to redirect attention to God. It's very important because many times when we come from different backgrounds to the Lord, in the earlier backgrounds and tradition, there is a lot of punishing the flesh to attain favor from God. But that is not at all the idea here, that we are not fasting to punish our flesh to please God, but it is helping us to redirect our attention to God and it is paying attention to the inner man, the inner man. And that's why fasting helps us to overcome things of the flesh and be led by the Spirit. The same verse that I was quoting Romans 8, 13 and 14. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. And fasting changes us, not God. Remember that fasting changes us, not God. We are not changing God. God is the same. He is the great I am. 
is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it changes us. It changes us. There was, uh, I heard about this story about the saint praying to God. You know, there was a big hillock right in front of his house and he was praying to God, God, that should move out, you know, because your word says that if I pray, mountains can move. And, uh, he has been praying and uh, and he sends the God telling him to go and physically push that as an act of faith. And he was doing that for several years. And one day in desperation he said, God, this has not even moved an inch. What's the whole purpose of your telling me to pray? And God said, look at your muscles. <laughs> the mountain did, did not move, but you have developed strength. You have become a stronger person. That's what happens, friends, when we fast and pray. Sometimes you will not get the answer, but God will just tweak your perspective on that issue. That's what is needed. Just a change in the way you understand things, a change in your perspective, which will be more kingdom oriented, which will be more something that God wants you to look from eternity's point of view, and you are looking it only from the temporal perspective. That's what happens when we pray, fast and pray. So God changes us. God helps us to get a renewed perspective. A, cla a very beautiful example is the case of Habakkuk. You know, Habakkuk is praying. You know, he's looking at the whole uh, apostasy of the nation of Israel and he's crying out to God, God, how, how come you're looking at this and keeping silent? And God is saying that I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and they will be an instrument of punishment. And he's not able to understand God's plan and that's when he's waiting upon God and God is changing his perspective that and he comes out with this beautiful poem in chapter 3 that even though things may not work in the way that I like I will yet trust in God because the righteous will live by faith you know, he comes with that beautiful conclusion God changes his perspective so fasting is not to appear more spiritual than others it is not to appear more spiritual than others. And it should be done in a spirit of humility and joyful attitude. I was encouraging my church to fast and pray and one young man said, Pastor, if I fast, I'm going to die. <laughs> he felt it so critical. He felt so challenged, you know, because he has never fasted. So I had to encourage him that I'm not asking you to fast for 40 days or 10 days. Maybe you can start with one meal, you know, one meal. Might be you skip your dinner. And if you're having an early dinner, you have fasted quite some time till the next breakfast. You know, you start small. Uh, so it should not be a burden or a duty, but something very joyful with the spirit of humility, with a joyful attitude. And Bible clearly tells us that fasting should be limited to a set time. Set time. Uh, Jesus fasted for 40 days. So I can't say I'm going to fast for 45 days. You know. You know don't be supra spiritual and become, you know, oh. It says that uh, uh, when, when we look at the passage in Matthew later on, we'll see that Jesus fasted. Moses was 40 days and 40 nights before God and he was not uh, eating anything and he was there. So it should be limited to a set time, what God is speaking and never forget that it's for deeper fellowship with God. It's for deeper fellowship with God and more the critical situation, the more appropriate the fasting and prayer. More the critical situation. I think we need to bow down and seek God's face in fasting and prayer. I think I, last time when I came, I shared this story with you. But I think I can share it again because I'm sure you have forgotten. <laughs> so that gives preachers the advantage. You know? We were in uh, 
North Bihar, Sitamadi, as pioneer evangelists, church planters, and we were there spreading the gospel, trying to pastor, pioneer a church there. And here was this brother who came from little away from that place called Raksal. He came there and he came and met me and said that I have huge family conflicts. My wife says that you don't stay in the house until you work. You better go and work. And if you're not bringing in some money for the family, you don't stay in the family. So he's totally broken. There's a conflict, a little conflict. And he came running to me and said, Pastor, if I can get some job, weekend I can go to my family. And I'm, so I knew a doctor um, couple there, husband, wife, doctors. And uh, I used to go and share the gospel. And good friends they were. And I contacted them. I said, here is a brother. He knows a little bit basic uh, compounding work and you know helping work and why can't you employ him if he's, if there is a vacancy? He said, great, pastor since you recommended, send him. So this brother was working very nicely but after one week he took the cash box and vanished. And here is the doctor calling me and saying that this guy has vanished with a whole money and we are going to file a police complaint and we are going to put you, your name, Just imagine getting caught by the Bihar police. <laughs> and my wife is there, my eldest daughter, Deepa, she's only six months. My wife is new to that place, my daughter is there. Huge crisis. What do you think I did? Fasted and prayed, no other option. <laughs> Fell flat before God's face. I said, God have mercy. It's a very tough situation. Fasted and prayed. Third day, <laughs> third day, the Lord spoke to me. Thankfully, the Lord did not allow me to get arrested. Third day, the Lord spoke to me. Everything is solved. Get up, resume your work. And I get a call after that from this doctor saying that we finally thought that there is no point in filing a case. So we have dropped all the charges. So you are... Um, if, if this brother comes into contact with you, send him to us, otherwise we are forgetting the whole thing. It's a miracle. It's a miracle what happened. And God showed us favor. So that's why I said the more critical the situation, the more appropriate the fasting and prayer. And we need to always look whether it's a ritual or is it springing from a genuine relationship with the Lord. This is very important. That Christian disciplines can often turn, become a ritual. A ritual, you know. Now, what's the difference between doing things as a ritual and doing things that spring out of a relationship? What do you think? What's the difference? External. Okay. Checklist like we are taking off, we are doing. Huh? Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Relationship. Ah. Did it? Okay. Okay. Right. Between the two. Yeah. Ritual more is uh, dry. There's no life in that. If you're praying as a ritual, so 15 minutes I'm going to pray. After five minutes, what's this? Khatam nahi or Time khatam nahi or Ritual hai. Because you are you you are doing it as a ritual, but relationship, ah, you are talking with your friend. Suddenly phone आता है पत्नी का क्या कर रहे हो कहाँ पर हो अरे एक घंटा हो गया relationship that is life. That's the difference. That when we fast and pray, 
when it is a ritual, there is a lot of dryness in that. There is a lot of heaviness. But when it is springing from a genuine relationship with God, we will be doing it as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. And finally I want to say, close this with saying that when we are fasting and praying, we should constantly check the bottom line. Is it to honor and glorify God? Is it to honor and glorify God? Is this fasting and prayer to honor God and to glorify God? Yeah. How do we honor and glorify God? You say, how do you cross check whether you are yes. I want something. Uh. As you were saying, you entered that screen and you were praying. Praying. How? Right. Like something to work out. Work it out. Yeah. How do you both glorify God? Yeah. Um, uh, I think that if that fasting and prayer also took me to that Sitamadi Jade, I think God has a plan might be to take me there and to share the witness there. That answer for that prayer was that I got a deliverance. So might be if God's glory is that, that it should uh, result in my imprisonment, maybe God has some plan there. So uh, the, the whole thing when we are fasting and praying is, Lord, the answers are not like what I want, but what will bring glory to your name? Because when, when uh, the whole thing in taking up the cross is constantly saying to the Lord, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. The I, the ego, the self, you know. We are all self-oriented, more of self-preservation, you know, that thing. You know, when we are disciples, when we seek the honor and glory of God, uh, it's more about Him, His honor, His will being done, His kingdom coming. That is the main thing. And uh, I think that uh, when we fast and pray, we need to check, you know, whether it's for the honor and the glory of God, whether this is bringing glory to His name.